Welcome to our series, Masterminds, Lessons in Leadership. I am joined by my co-host, Peter Linneman, where we discuss the intersection of strategy and leadership, which is at the vortex of what we feel makes all great companies great. And we're delighted to have joining us today, Mitch Shaw, who is not only a friend and a client of both Peter's and mine, uh, but is the founder and CEO of Noble Investment Group, and is probably the most one of the most widely known and widely respected uh, people clearly in the hospitality industry and even more broadly than that. So Mitt, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And if you could tell the audience, give us a little bit of the history of the firm and maybe some of your board activities, that would be great before we get into our session. Bill and uh, Peter, thank you. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure being here uh, with you uh, today. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, when, when I think about our story and uh, where, you know, uh, it is that we came from, uh, it's not dissimilar from a lot of uh, ownership groups in the hospitality industry. You know, if you kind of peel back the, uh, the overall uh, sector, 60,000 hotels throughout the United States, uh, a little over 10% of those are, uh, are are select service extended stay hotels that are owned by uh, mom and pop smaller owner operators throughout the country. It's a beautiful American dream story, and, and uh, in that vein, that's how um, I found myself in this business. My parents became the proud owner of the Winkler Motor Inn uh, when I was ten years old, and uh, this was the family business that I grew up in. Uh, we would uh, do laundry and then we would clean rooms and then we'd be at the front desk. Um, and so I learned at the early age kind of the ethos of the business, right? That it is a people business. It is a service business. Um, in some ways, I found myself not wanting to do that for the rest of my life and went to school uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do something that was finance oriented, but I needed a job. And uh, I got hired uh, by the University Conference Center that Marriott ran. Uh, because I had the prerequisite experience of uh, being able to uh, operate the Hobic front desk system, which was an archaic card system that you'd go in and fill out. They were looking for somebody with three years of experience. And lo and behold, as a 17-year-old freshman, I had it. You fast forward four years, uh, and I, I graduated from college um, uh, in 1991 uh, at, a, at, a, at a very dynamic time, as we all remember, uh, in, in, in the economy and in the world. And uh, I ended up getting a job with a small investment firm uh, that was uh, uh, making a big stake in a new product called Limited Service Hotels. But here was the catch. They wanted somebody that had a finance uh, degree and someone that had five years of operating experience uh, so they could, you know, figure out, you know, the, the intersection of the hospitality industry and this unique model. And so there I was uh, uh, getting a new haul moving to Atlanta and, uh, uh, and finding myself in this very uh, um, exciting time uh, in growth. And six months later, uh, the partner that was running the group left to go farm their own shop. And so it was really the wild, wild west. I was learning how to read construction plans, architectural documents. I was sitting in meetings with, you know, with, with respected developers. Uh, I was uh, working with uh, the very, one of the, some of the very first CMBS deals uh, uh, that, were, that were taking place. And I was doing all these things, essentially a kid, but it gave me a very formative experience uh, in, in thinking about uh, the difference, you know, between great organizations and those that were just kind of following the money. Um, you know, we used to laugh at it at the time. We'll all joke and it says, you know, there's a difference between two people and a cell phone uh, and a real organization. And uh, I found that out, you know, through 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 those efforts. And so in my mind, uh, when I started um, thinking about what it is that I wanted uh, to really accomplish, uh, it was the combination of all those experiences that gave me the courage uh, to say, you know, I might be able to do this on my own. And in 1993, uh, we forged ahead uh, and and really with a goal to say, let's go, let's go figure out what we can do here. Um, but a lot of that is really I, I owe to the history that I had and the experiences that I had, uh, you know, in, in my formative years. And I have to ask, Bill, I know this is a little out of order. Do your parents still own the motor, the Winkle Motor Lodge? 
No, Peter, um, they, they do not. And, uh, and, and I, I will tell you that um, a, the, the only way that I could have started this business is if I would have figured out how to help them refinance the Winkler Motor Inn and uh, a, a couple of minority investments that they had had in a few other things uh, to give me uh, the ability to borrow from them uh, mm -hmm. enough money to build a small Hampton Inn, and I'll go back and you know during those days you could you know you could do that with a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, which is real money by the way, uh, and uh, uh, and so my parents you know trusted me enough and bet uh, the, the 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 ranch if you if you will uh, on on a young kid in a dream. So. Mitt, on, on strategy, 2019 was one environment. Uh, starting in March 2020, it was a very different environment. And now, probably right around now or a month or so ago, it was a very different environment. How have you curated your strategy over that in real time and, and directionality? Where are you going? You know, Peter, um, I know in our conversations, uh, we, we, we uh, share this with each other. Uh, every 10 years or so, something happens uh, in our industry uh, that you could never expect, right? And we use the words, uh, word unprecedented uh, in that conversation. And the ruble collapse in 98, that was unprecedented. Yeah. The dot-com bust of 2000, of course, you know, the tremendous tragedy of 9-11 uh, and, and the GFC, you know, the financial sector will never be back again. Well, um, you know, when, I think as we think about that, like how could how could it how could it be worse? Uh, you know, you you dropped, you know, 9.2 uh, percent rev par after the tragedy of 9-11, 18.6 percent after the GFC. Last year, U.S. rev par dropped 51.8 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, never before did hotels, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, face this dynamic of do you keep them open or do you shut them down uh, based on the magnitude of this health crisis and this, you know, the economic crisis that that ensued. So I'll go back to your question um, with with a, with, a, with a couple of, of different points. In 2019, the concern really was that we were averaging two percent revenue per available room growth, you know, similar to what GDP, over 98, uh, you know, uh, per plus percent uh, correlation between real GDP and hotel demand over a 30 plus year period. Um, I'm, I'm talking to an economist, you know, so of course, you know, that number, right? And it always reverts back to the mean. And, and so, you know, part of the concern was like, where's GDP going? Where's REPAR going? And oh, by the way, like, it's kind of hard in an operating environment to, to really create alpha um, you know, in, uh, you know, without really thinking about what uh, the, the, the opportunities are um, in various different markets and like. So in 2019, we were trying to figure out the markets that we thought were going to grow higher than the U.S. macro, take costs out of the system and, and kind of think about income as being an opportunity, uh, you know, in this uh, in this uh, sector. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, you know, we we had an opportunity in which to sell two thirds of our portfolio in 2019. So the good news was that they were ready to sell. No crystal ball, but, you know, just hotels ready to sell. So our problems, as we found ourselves in in March of last year, were smaller, but they were the same problems. That, that others had. Now, they were better because there were select service extended stay hotels. You can make money at 50% occupancy, right? Because you only have 20, 25 full-time employees, but there's still real problems. You're still trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what, what are the right pivot points to be the best fiduciary, to be the best human being, um, to take care of your people, um, and to think about the magnitude of this crisis and, and, and ensuring the fact you got liquidity to deal with the next two years. Now, we all zero base our budgets in this business, like you should, right? And, and, and as we go through it, you say, what happens if you're up 5%? What happens if you're down 5%? What happens if you're down 10%? You're not talking about down 51.8%. And so as we think about like the time period that we were in, um, you know, there was a lot of new conversations, uh, and, and like others in the business, we'd have a 7.30 a.m. Zoom with our senior team, and then we'd have a 7.30 p.m. Zoom, right? We call it, it was the tale of two halves, and that allows us to get through the day, 
and uh, you know you have dinner with your family, right? Maybe go on a walk, and you come back and you kind of recap in terms of uh, what's happened. And 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 I think the power of great teams really manifested itself as they all as they always do during crisis, right? You, you know who you're in the trenches with, and you trust them, and you believe in them. And if you've got great teams, you figure your way out. And so when people ask me, like, what did you learn um, going through it? I said, I, 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 I always start with, I learn that the people that, that I am fortunate in which to lead are truly the very best of the best. And with them, I'll go arm in arm, toe to toe, as we have for 28 years, and continue to fight, you know, each and every day uh, for, for doing the things that really matter. Well, made a good segue into the concept of um, culture. You know, as Peter and I have talked to a variety of leaders uh, in the industry, um, they seem to correlate this whole concept of having a strong culture with business success. Uh, give us a little bit of a perspective on how powerful culture is at Noble and characterize for us, if you would, the culture at Noble. Well, you know, Bill, I think in every organization, um, the word culture um, is used because we recognize, you know, how, how valuable it is in terms of our, our missions. Um, and obviously to do that, you have to figure out the best way in which to attract um, the best people. You know, I think, um, you know, the the best coaches have the best players, right? Uh, and uh, that works, right? and it's, it's, it, that's kind of, that's kind of how, that's kind of how it works. Um, as you both know, um, the, the name noble really came from a word we used around our family when we were growing up. Um, and it was a the name that my parents carried from them from India, which was a name that my, you know, word that my, um, and, and, and there's a, there's a, uh, there's, there's a, a Gujarati, uh, uh, translation to that, that that they used over there, but that was a word that we used about your actions. Um, we you know will always have a choice to be um, uh, the most lucrative thing, the easiest thing. Make sure it's always the right thing um, with all the constituents. Make it the noble thing. And so when you know you kind of kid in a dream in 1993 and you're like, hey, you got to name name your company. There was only one name. It was it was going to be noble, and that's what we tried to. Um, we, we tried to make sure it was woven into our DNA. Now, to do that, you have to find people that truly believe in that with the character and the competency to be able to, um, to execute. And, uh, and the only way that I knew how to do that was through alignment. And so I was very intentional at the very beginning about um, creating real alignment. You know, I had the great fortune of starting with the business um, and, and, and being able to have, you know, the, the ownership of the business. And, and again, as both of you know, um, I had that as, as real uh, enticements to go and attract really good human beings that had the competency that I thought together, not to go use it, the best coaches, you know, have the best players to bring together a team. So now, um, you know, after, you know, 28 years, we've got a team that's been together an average of over 20 years. And I think about it actually really simply um, as a as a student, um, Emerson was really my my my, my favorite, um, you know, uh, writer and, and poet. And, uh, um, you know, he would say that our chief want in life is someone to inspire us to be what we could become. And I feel like that's our responsibility to one another. Right. Like everybody has dreams and our responsibility collectively is to help each other achieve, uh, you know, our, our our dreams, and so we've been very intentional about um, doing that together, having communications, alignment of of ownership and interests, and um, you know, my, my 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 dear friend John Gray, who you who had on, you know, um, uses the right word, a meritocracy, right? And if people believe in that. Um, and, and you live it and you lead by it, um, it really is a self-fulfilling, uh, uh, you know, uh, cultural, uh, you know, example. And, and I would also say one other thing. I've been very fortunate that um, our team, while very, very intelligent, uh, you know, no one's ever said, I want to be the smartest person in the room. Right? They felt like and uh, over time that our job was to collectively build upon 
you know, what we hope to be really the brightest room uh, in our sector and to continue to learn uh, and, and grow by bringing in others into our group and then learning and growing externally, you know, whether that's through executive development, uh, public company boards, other types of areas uh, in which you grow. So when we use the word culture, um, I believe that it is a combination of each of those different areas acting kind of together um, as one that you know, has uh, you know, that's built this. Now, the challenge, I would say, is that we're now 28 years old. I'm not the same kid that started this business, you know, uh, back in 1993. And it, I but I have another 20 years, at least, I hope of, you know, solid run rate. So we can accomplish something that very few real estate organizations of our size and scale can do, which is to have a, a generational dec multi-decade run as a, you know, a thoughtful, successful fiduciary. Um, and so now how do you build upon that culture with another generation, right? Um, I'm starting to have, you know, great leaders retire. Um, and, uh, and, and that is new. It's not new in business, but it's, it's, it's new for us. So um, I would say I spent a lot of time thinking about the evolution of culture going forward. So, Bill, it sounds like we, 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 we know how Noble got its name. We need to go find the firm Pillage and Plunder. <laughs> and uh, as the counterpoint, right? <laughs> I've got to Google Pillage and Plunder Inc. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there. It's in partners is very unoriginal. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. So, Nick, your evolution, um, and this is my characterization, was almost uh, a hook or crook, get any of the money I can from any legit source, friends and family, literally. Um, then private equity, uh, big guys and, and so forth, and then fully integrated, your own funds, uh, soup to nut, right? You run the properties, you raise the funds. Talk to me about that evolution strategically. Yeah. Look, I think we all have to start from somewhere, right? And, and, and our roots, are, again, I'll go back to this you know, great American dream story that exists today. If you look at, again, what Noble's niche is today, um, they're out of, again, 60,000 hotels. There's, you know, a uh, little less than 10 percent of them that are our target, um, you know, 5,500 hotels or so, $150 billion of assets, 80 percent owned by mom and pops, 20 percent owned by institutions. And those mom and pops, they raise money through friends and family. You know, they go and build a great $40 million hotel. Uh, they get a $30 million loan from their local lender. They sign full recourse and, and they pass around the half for $10, you know, $10 million uh, around the community. That's how we started. Again, the numbers were a lot smaller back then, uh, but, you know, same kind of example. And, uh, and you know, that, that's kind of how we built the business from 93 to 99. And then uh, I think, you know, a, a lot of our collective, you know, group success um, gave us visibility to uh, partnering with, you know, some 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 great uh, real estate, uh, you know, private funds um, that taught us um, how to uh, to think about being an institutional fiduciary, right? And we really cut our teeth with some best in class, um, you know, uh, institutional in investors. And then, you know, we get this call from Terry Ahern at, at Townsend in 2006 to say. You know, we're looking for a dedicated hospitality manager for our clients, and we'd like to talk to you about that. And um, we soon embark upon being, you know, uh, a fiduciary to some of the best institutions uh, throughout uh, America. And I'll tell you where we got lucky. Um, really, really fortunate in that our group of LPs that we started with uh, were not only some of the very best, well-known, most respected. Um, the, the ultimate beneficiary were, were those that, you know, we could, we could truly align with, right? So whether these are state pension plans um, of our, you know, um, public employees and, and, and teachers and, 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 and law enforcement and the like, or their universities um, where, you know, you're, you're helping for, for, you know, kids to go to college, um, or you're thinking about, um, giving back in a material way in our communities. And it actually helped us think about how we could take this noble organization 
you know, with with, you know, our, our desire and, and, and figure out ways in which to um, help make an impact in, in these communities. And what I'd say to you, Peter, is that part of this evolution, as you're as you're a real estate investment manager, it's sort of like I'll go back and again, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the, the the sports analogy like you're a kid and you're and you're doing really well and you want to go play, you know, uh, in college and then you want to go play you know, professionally. Well, being an institutional real estate investment manager is is the professionals. It's the big leagues. Right. And 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 not everybody gets to do it. And if you do it, you know, you really need to be um, the best at it. Otherwise, you may not get to do it anymore. And, and we wake up every day thinking about that as our responsibility across a number of different paradigms. But if you can do it and you can actually go win and do it with people that you love and you care about internally and also with an LP base, like all of this comes together in a really, really special way. You know, we all heard Simon Sinek say, you know, hey, figure out your why, right? Here's what you do. Here's how you do it. But, you know, really focus on why you do it. Well, for us, the why became super clear, right? We were making a real impact and a real difference. You know, you want to you you want to go and 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 get after it seven days a week, you know, at all hours of the day. It's because if you don't, it's not costing you, you know, simply this. There's an impact to an end fiduciary that really matters. And so, I I, I would say, Peter, the two things I think we're very very fortunate. One, people trusted us. When I would say that. I'm not sure, you know, uh, six, eight years into our life cycle, we deserved all the trust that we're getting. But because of that trust, um, it gave us enormous energy to go and focus on the things that matter that now I focus 28 years later and, uh, you know, this 100% fully realized track, rec track record up until, you know, our most recent fund that, you know, we realized all through every one of the cycles that I've mentioned earlier, there's no chance we'd have been able to do that if not for the belief and trust that others gave us. And I will also say, now go back to this next 20 years, um, that trust has to continue to get earned every single you know period of time as, as we go forward. So Mitt, earlier you touched on this whole issue of um, leadership lessons and, and our industry actually is blessed with more than many industries as far as founders who have taken their companies to great places. And you're part of that list. If somebody asked you to look back at the evolution, 28 years, and really describe your aha moment, uh, that leadership lesson that you'll never forget in building and, and leading your firm, what would it be? In, uh, in 2001, um, we, you know, we we were um, a company again, eight years old. Um, we had gotten through. You know, the, we, a lot of people don't talk about the Ruble class, but if you're a developer, right, um, and you had hotels under construction, and that's what you did, you know, kind of this, you know, uh, th this industry. And all of a sudden, there was no permanent capital market, and you had a bunch of things like it was a pretty big crisis. Well, we got through that. We got through the dot com, you know, bust, and we were we were pretty we were feeling pretty good. And so, in in two thousand one, um, we had we had made a big stake and focus from a growth standpoint going forward. We had partnered for the very first time with uh, with institutional capital, you know, in a private fund that we had as a partner in institutional capital. So now we had, you know, we, we had that component on it. And um, there's a there, there's a, a, a receipt that's in my office right now, just just to the right of me that's still on my board. Um, and uh, it was a big dinner that I hosted with my team. And we had a lot of things going on. We had just bought our first, you know, uh, Marriott Hotel. We had four hotels under development. We were under contract with two more. And we're strategic planning for the future. And this is the right time. It was the fall. And it was a typical dinner. It was, you know, here's, here's you know, a few drinks. Here's, you know, here's some big steaks and, and, and this and that. And at 11.07 p.m., you know, the time stamp on the thing, sign the check. And we're meeting in the office 7.30 in the morning, you know, the next morning. Well, the receipt uh, shows the full detail of the bill. But it also says September 10th, 2001 on it. Mm. And I remember, because all of us remember, 
Um, but it's not that day that is etched forever in my memory uh, because our strategic planning meeting started the day before, then it was that day. But then I remember September 12th and I remember just having to go in the office because everything I was remember was just shut down. And, you know, we're in Atlanta, so it was a different scenario, uh, you know, for us here. But I remember coming to the office uh, early in the morning. My entire team was here hmm. on their offices. And um, I looked around, we walked around, we hugged, we talked, and then we got together and we met and we talked about what we we're going to do next. I remember looking around the room and as a young leader, not really knowing um, what was going to happen next, you know, you, you, there's fear has many bounds that you go through, but they made me feel like um, we could accomplish whatever we needed to accomplish going forward, even though we didn't know what that was. And I remember at that time knowing that I had something. I had the blessings of having those that cared about our community, you know, the sense of belonging that we were all trying to create together. Um, and I knew that, you know, that was something. And I kind of made it my mission thereafter to say, you know, let's never stop figuring out what we can do together. And, you know, that was a pivotal time. So you've mentioned, you've mentioned your parents a couple of times. I don't know if they're still alive. Um, they are. I hope so. They are. Alive Thank and healthy. You. Thank and you. I, if I told you I've got them on the phone here, and I'm about to ask them what about you makes them most proud, what do you think they're going to say? You know, I, um, I, 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 I talk to my parents. I'm, I'm very fortunate yet. They're both with us. Um, and, uh, we, I, I see them often and, uh, uh you know, our, our family, uh, is, the unit is, is, is all here. Um, I think they would say that. I think they would say that, uh, what, you know, my wife Reshma, uh, um, has meant to our family, what our kids who are now 23 and 20, um, you know, who they are as human beings, um, how, uh, how, how they represent um, the sacrifices um, that, um, you know, my grandparents made, their grandparents made, um, what we've tried to do, how we all together, um, you know, uh, you know, have, have taken this opportunity, you know, immigrant family uh, coming here and uh, continue to uh, try and do the right things. I think they'd be very proud of that family, you know, uh, unit and how it stayed together and how, um, you know, through all times and, and all periods, how that's mattered the most. And, um, and, and, and I, hope that, um, I hope that that's exactly what, you know, I would say about our children, um, if asked that question, you know, I'll still be around and yeah. I will ask that question of them when, you, when they're your because, age. Trust me, I'm going to ask them that. And I'm going to have you on the phone on the other end. Because Peter and Bill, I, we know each other well enough that isn't that what you hope that they would say? Of course. Right? Of course. Like, yeah. does, right. does, does anything else matter more? Of right? course. And uh, um, so, you know, I, I'm hopeful that that's... Uh, that, that's something that, you know, uh, will continue to be said about all of our families right. as, as we go forward. So, Mitt, I've got three words that have been calligraphized above my head, and Peter's going to talk about the third one in a minute, generosity. Uh, but the other two are humility and integrity. And over the course of my 40-some years in this business, I have found that almost to the person that those are three words that the great leaders live by. And humility is about giving other people credit um, for the success that any individual has had. And as we've talked to leaders, uh, we've asked another wonderful question, which is, tell us about your mentors. You know, who is your greatest mentor and what did you learn? Uh, how would you answer that question? Bill, I, I've been very fortunate. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've, I've, um, I've been very fortunate um, to have had great mentors, as you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think out of the, the many that I've had the opportunity to call on across all different times and all different, you know, situations, 
um, two that that really come to mind. And, and I would say the second one, not 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 um, uh, because I you know you asked me about one, but I, I would say two because we've lost both of them um, this year are Arnie Sorensen and Mark Elliott. Mm. And, um, you know, they, they were um, like brothers to me. And I would say that 75% um, of our conversations were about family and humanity and faith and things that matter outside of business. And I call them um, and we talk and our conversations um, we're, we're, we're very focused on what we just said, the things that matter the most. And, um, but yet they, they were incredible stewards of their businesses, iconic, mm -hmm. um, created, um, it, you know, uh, in, in, in amazing amounts of vitality across the industry and did things that no one that was there before them, um, had done. But yet they still found the way to be such incredible fathers and spouses and brothers. And they seemingly were able to do it all. And I think we struggle sometimes. With like, how do we do it all? How are we, you know, how are we the, the best father and the best, you know, spouse and the best friend and the best leader? Is there enough time in the day? Can we get it done? But, you know, for, for me, the two of them um, represented all that's good in in humanity, and um, I, you know, I I uh, um, I miss um, you know I, I I miss the ability to engage, and uh, and and if you ask me, you know, um, I I would have I would have said um, I would have said my father because of all he means to me, I just, you know, I, and I would have said, you know, Arnie and, and Mark, uh, but there are others. And I think in some way, it's our responsibility to be that for others as mm. well, right? There's lots of successful people, incredibly successful people. Um, and, uh, um, and, but, but those that can kind of hit the trifecta, um, I'm, you know, I'm amazed by. You know, and I think that's that's really my life's journey. I'm, I'm continuing to try to figure out how to be the very best father and husband and friend and leader that I can be, um, you know, across all of those um, uh, areas. Amen. And, Amen. And, and, and Bill has, as he says behind him, it's, it says uh, um, generosity is the last. Talk to us a minute um, as we head down the home stretch here about how philanthropy of time, energy, uh, monetary figures into your life and focus? Peter, um, it's very important um, for, for us um, simply because um, I'll go back to it, you know, that, um, you know, everybody has dreams. And, and I think our, our job is, as human beings is to help others um, achieve theirs. And, and philanthropy for us has been very educationally rooted. Um, and for students that can't um, uh, necessarily afford the means um, to go to schools that they are totally qualified uh, in which uh, and, 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 and need to go to, um, and uh, as well as around the world um, from a healthcare standpoint and, and child you know, hood poverty and, uh, and nutrition and wellness. And so those things um, are important because without those things, you know, my, my parents grew up in a, in a small rural manufacturing town in India and uh, a very similar story, like uh, didn't arrive here with anything, if not for student financial aid. Um, my father uh, wouldn't have been able to go to college. I wouldn't have been able to go to college. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my dad, my dad made twenty four thousand dollars a year um, when I left for college and I had to work and I had to get student loans and I had to have student financial aid. And if not for those things and a family that pushed me, um, I, I wouldn't have had those. So I think for us, when we think about um, what do we, um, what do we spend, what do we save and what do we give, right? It's the old adage, it's the three jars, right? It, 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 et cetera. The giving part is intentional because I think it's the flywheel for humanity. 
the more that we can do for this next generation to grow up and to lead lives that matter, the better off, you know, all of us will truly be. And so that's kind of, that's how we've thought about, um, you know, um, the importance of what we'd like to do. Bill, I'll let you get the last question and take us home. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. So let's fast forward, Mitt, 20 years from now. And here's your opportunity to give back. And let's say your next generation of leadership is around the table and you want to impart a special word of wisdom, uh, having run the firm for almost 50 years, right? What What's the most important thing that they need to know from you as fiduciaries of the business going forward? The, the easiest thing to say is to always do the right thing, not the most lucrative thing, not the easiest thing. Those decisions seem obvious when times are good. Um, they should seem very obvious when times aren't as good, right? And, uh, and so there's a fundamental, I call it the name on the door, right? It's, 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 it's there for a reason. But that's, that's the collective viewpoint. And I would be um, disappointed if we have a group of leaders that were here that, that, that didn't have a stake in the ground, didn't wear you know, the, the, the name on their sleeve. But on a personal level, here, here's what I say to our team all, every year. So when we sit down and we talk about the next year, I say be incredibly deliberate about your peer group and your aspirational peer group. You know, you asked me a great question. Who are your who are, who are your mentors? You know, the other question, who are your heroes? They might not be your mentors, but who are your heroes? Who are the people that you look up, look up to and why? You know, for whatever discipline that might be, whether it's as a, you know, parent or uh, or as a, as a, a philanthropist or 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 some other things. I said, and let's go figure out how to make them a part of your peer group, right? So that you can learn and grow and develop and try new things and have experiences. And um, because that to me is the beautiful part of what we do together um, in teams, right? You, you, you help each other think about, you know, um, what it is that you could become, right? And so I hope that, they, that, 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 that we're sitting with a room uh, of leaders that have incredible amounts of desire to continue to grow and develop and learn and not be the smartest person in the room, um, but also respect the name on the door and and to all, to do the right thing when it's really hard to do the right things sometimes. Well, Matt, that is terrific. And Peter, I, I don't know if we're really smart or just dumb lucky, but most of the people we've interviewed have not had a chance to see any of the other interviews. That's and correct. Yeah, the answers to the questions that we have asked, whether it be about, you know, what do they want to be remembered for, who are their mentors, whatever, are remarkably similar. Yeah. Why, why do you think that's luck? That that has to do with our ability to identify great leaders. You I, know? Didn't admit I didn't set them up for that, just so you know. Uh, anyhow, but Mitt, thank you. This has been terrific, you know, heartfelt and thoughtful. And that's who you are, and that's why we love you. So thank, thank you for you. being part of this very much. So um, I couldn't imagine doing it with two better, two two better people that I that I love and respect that are part of my peer group. So thank you. 